Talking today to Richard Matteson, who is the CEO of TrueCost. Richard, describe for me in a nutshell what TrueCost does. Basically, TrueCost are experts in environmental measurement. Um, so what we do is we look at uh, a corporate's environment, a company's environmental impact, and we measure that in environmental terms, obviously, but also we put a price on the environmental impact of the company, so we measure it in financial terms as well. You provide companies with what you describe as an environmental skyline, which covers water, waste, land, waste, land and water pollutants, air pollutants and natural resource use. How do you measure them and how do you compare them against the average for companies? Sure, we've got one of the world's most comprehensive databases on corporate environmental impacts. So for the past 12 years we've been gathering and analysing companies' impacts. And so we've got, um, we analyse 4,500 companies every year. Um, that covers about 93% of the glo globe's market capitalization. Uh, it includes about a million uh, disclosures from those companies themselves over that time period. So we've got a robust data set that we use essentially to compare organizations on different environmental metrics. And what are the global reporting standards that companies are, are required to give and that you rely on and how do these vary? Yeah, it's, it's, it's an evolving space, is what I would say. So the standards largely are voluntary. Um, we comply with the major voluntary standards that are out there. So there's the greenhouse gas protocol, for example. Um, but there's an evolu evolution occurring at the moment um, away from standalone environmental reporting compliant with standalone environmental standards to integrated reporting with financial accounts. And that's been... Um, harnessed really by an organization called the IIRC and so we're working with them um, and there's also uh, a move towards expressing environmental impact in financial terms so that you don't necessarily need new standards you just need to think about environmental impacts in new ways and express those in, in comparable ways to the way you're thinking about financial accounts today. And briefly how does something like um, environmental impact translate into a financial cost on the balance sheet? Well, um, the problem here is understanding the linkages. Um, so what happens, for example, today, H&M announced uh, one of the, the, the worst profit one of them announced for the last eight years. And the reason why is because of an impact on the price of cotton for them, one of their major raw materials. Now, that pricing issue has occurred because of an environmental issue, partly. Um, droughts, floods, uh, pestilence or overuse of pesticides, all those things impact on raw material pricing. Uh, for example, 40 gallons of water go into one gallon extracted of oil. So we have issues to do with um, natural resources that we require um, and ecosystems are the things that support the growth and the, the production of those natural resources. And so if you don't think about ecosystems and price the value of those systems, then you could have a real cost that hits your business like H&M has had today. And in terms of those these kinds of measures, who are the worst companies and why and who are the best companies? That's, <clears throat> that's quite a difficult question to answer. We run something called the Newsweek Green Rankings every year in collaboration with Newsweek obviously and another organisation called Sustainalytics. And what that ranking uh, does is it ranks companies on their policies, their management procedures, their strategies and their performance. And so we have some winners and losers in that. But the key thing to understand about that is really that you can't just say oil and gas companies are bad, full stop, and banks or service organizations are very good, full stop. It's about a comparison between companies in the same sector, the same type of activity, and to screen out, for example, a single sector, um, a financial institution could not do that because clearly we rely on oil today. Mm. Um, now clearly we want to shift to a more sustainable future. But So when, when you're asking a question about the worst and the best, um, it, it does depend on how you look at that. For example, in the green rankings that we just did, uh, Tiro Price, financial institution, came out worse because of its lack of transparency around how it's managing its environmental issues, even though its environmental issues are very, very low, really, um, apart from its financing activities. Um, and the best was Munich Re, another financial institution, and Philips, for example, was also in the top ten. So uh, we conduct rankings on the basis of comparables, and, and that's the main thing to, to think about there. But if um, we took one of the measures, a water use, what would, what would a, a good company in terms of water use be in a bad company? 
A good company would be a company that is understanding and managing its risk, in our view. Not necessarily a company that purely doesn't use water. So I think um, you know, we need to be careful about the trajectory and the path we're following towards sustainability and, and how that's reflected in what people say is good and bad. Um, clearly regulators will seek to place a tax on bad and incentivize good, and that, that's great. Um, but even in the EU, we have the Lisbon agenda about competitiveness. You can't simply destroy the competitiveness of one player in an industry, for example. So what you do do, though, is you create, for example, a low emission zone around London. Um, if you're driving a very um, uh, polluting vehicle into London, you pay about £100. Um, and the reason for that is the health cost to the European Union is estimated at about 1.7% of GDP. And that's caused by the pollution from vehicles and stationary uh, emissions as well. And so what the European Union does is said, that is a cost to us. We want to translate that cost to the heaviest polluters. Now, that's an acceptable mm. approach to, to managing the situation. But then at the same time, one of our... It's a relatively imprecise one, though. It's a relatively imprecise one, but one that is actually quite effective because you don't find many lorries driving into London today that are very polluting. They change, they upgrade their fleets. And that actually saves them money as well because they're more efficient. But, for example, one of our clients is Formula One, not known for being the greenest sport in the world. Um, however, you know, they have set themselves a carbon reduction target. And with the reach they have globally and the fan base they have, they've got a, a great influence about on the, on the environmental agenda that they can leverage. Um, so, as I say, I think we need to be careful about goods and bads. Um, there are clear examples of uh, situations where there are very bad effects as a consequence of what one company does, like BP, for example. Um, but then there are other examples like Walmart and the good effect that it has in terms of reduction on packaging. So. And yet Walmart is... And how much is, has Walmart reduced its packaging? Well, it's actually saved somewhere in the region of $8 billion right. by doing that and reduced a huge amount of packaging out of its supply chain. And it did that, interestingly, by challenging its suppliers. So not coming up with all the answers itself, but challenging its supply chain to think about ways of both saving money and saving the planet. And what's the level of corporate focus on these issues? How... how good our businesses at, in a sense, getting a grip of this? Yeah, I think um, on the whole it's really an exercise that many large companies conduct, um, largely because they're coming under pressure from investors, they're coming under pressure from regulators who are in the spotlight and, and largely those companies are perhaps their major consumer brands or they're well known. Um, and they have resource, that's the key thing. I think smaller companies do struggle a bit um, and companies in emerging nations do struggle. But there is a great force for good here because large companies can, can significantly influence the behavior of smaller companies. If I think about the retailers and the amount of sourcing uh, they do in China, for example, um, then in the Pearl River Delta, um, there's about 50,000 manufacturers there that are really scratching their heads about how they can improve their environmental performance because their customers are asking and because they can gain more business out of doing that. And, and so I think you can't just say it's only the largest companies that are capable of doing something. If there's a business driver, any company can do this. And really what you're talking about is driving those changes down into the supply chain. Yes. Yeah. And that's that's how it works. So it yeah. translates down into small or medium and right exactly. way down the chain. And the good thing about that is it de-risks the supply chain. Because one of the challenges we have today is we've managed to outsource most of our primary production and secondary production like manufacturing to emerging nations where labor is cheap. Um, but as a consequence of that, we've actually outsourced our ability to control, for example, raw material pricing. And we have very little price signal flowing through the supply chain as a consequence of issues to do with water. So, for example, um, you have H&M announcing profit warnings because its suppliers are being hit by the inflated cost of cotton, not itself. And what level of interest is there in these kinds of environmental issues in developing countries like China, Brazil and India? If we take aside the supply chain drivers, are, are companies, developing market countries, saying to themselves, we must do this or, or not? Well, um, I think they absolutely are. Uh, Rio, there will be a big summit held in Rio, Rio Plus 20, and I think Brazil is, is very, very um, keen on these issues. We're working with a number of organisations in Brazil at the moment. China, for example, has set itself a carbon emissions reduction target. Now, 
having taken a stance for many, many years of, of appearing not to care about environmental issues too much, in its latest five-year plan, it set itself some target. It has some major water reduction targets too. But if you think about the carbon reduction target, that is good for the Chinese economy. And if I explain that argument, about 4% of China's GDP is lost due to air pollution, due to people dying younger than they should do, and so therefore a, a loss of productivity. Um, and fossil fuels cause carbon emissions. They also cause air pollution. So if you fix the problem associated with air pollution, the Chinese economy can grow faster, it can support the health of its people better, and it can satisfy global international treaties on climate change. And so you have a sort of triple whammy, if you like, of, of effects. Um, so I think the governments that are starting to realize that are, are really picking up the agenda and they see that it's in their economic welfare and interests to do something about these issues. And do you work with governments? Because it, it seems to me that they could use these kinds of measures, couldn't they, to actually we do. influence we do. policy? Yeah, absolutely. So in the UK, we work with uh, the Environment Agency, doing a lot of work both on the financing elements of, of um, the UK industry. We monitor the disclosure of the largest companies in the UK, in the FTSE All Share, every year. And in fact, we wrote the uh, environmental um, reporting guidelines for, for the UK government, for DEFRA. Um, Elsewhere in the world, we work for the Chinese government, thinking of innovative ways of stimulating green credit policies. So, how banks can lend to companies that are more environmentally friendly, and, and stop lending to companies that are very, very environmentally damaging. Um, so, we do we do quite a lot of work with governments. And I understand some countries will be introducing environmental labelling that will reflect these kinds of corporate environmental calculations. How will these work? That's. Again, an evolving space, like a lot of, lot of things in this area. Um, I think that if you look at um, the labelling, I think the problem is the evidence is not quite there that consumers will care enough if there's a green label on a product, um, especially if they have to pay more money. Now, the challenge there is that uh, the traditional, traditionally held view is that greener products are more expensive, and sometimes they are, actually. Um, and that's a challenge with labelling because uh, if you have a look at what Tesco has done recently, so Terry Lee, he announced that he wanted every product that Tesco sells to be labelled. They've just um, rescinded on that promise. And largely the reason why, in my view, is that uh, the cost of creating those labels and maintaining those labels is, is too expensive because of the complexity to do with the calculations. You might buy, Tesco might buy tomatoes that it stocks on its shelves, in eight different regions across the planet. So to put one label on one carton of tomatoes is misleading. Um, then there's the consumer side. Um, I think there's a lot of work to be done yet on understanding what drives consumer behavior with respect to green labeling. But I wouldn't give up hope. So if you look at the effect of fair trade, um, that has had a great effect. And a lot of retailers, you know, quite a significant proportion of the revenue comes through fair trade products. Um, so I think labelling will be... It's still a be, fairly modest proportion. It's though. a fairly modest proportion, but I think labelling will play uh, a part. Um, but the other opinion is to say that actually companies can affect um, as great a change, if not greater, um, by choice editing their supply chain. In other words, managing their businesses more responsibly with respect to what they're buying and the kind of way they design their products for the end consumer. So my view in the future is rather than having a dark green, the most benign product in the world sitting over here, and everything else. What we have is a system whereby, due to different design decisions or production decisions or manufacturing decisions, you have a gradation of products from, from white all the way through to light green and dark green. So the dark green one might be fully recycled, um, completely um, closed loop is the technical term. Mm. Um, well, meaning no that all materials, materials are extracted. Yeah. Um, all the way through to a product that might be designed in a way that actually cuts out the use of material that is quite hard on the environment. Um, all the way through to products that obviously have no or very little consideration for the environment in mind. Um, so the world is complex and I think we need to reflect that complexity and the trick is how you do that in a, in a label that's sufficiently well understood by consumers.